I want to talk to you today about what Christians discover that makes them lose their faith. Um, <clears throat> I can honestly say I've never heard a sermon like this one um, that I'm about to preach to you out there. I'm going to be very honest and very blunt here. I'm not going to mince words or be politically correct or any other thing concerned for people's feelings or whatever else. I'm going to be very honest in this study. Um, <clears throat> and I'm going to spell it out right at the beginning. You don't have to watch the whole sermon. I'm going to tell you what this whole thing is about before I get into the scriptures, before we go to the word of God, and I show you back up everything I'm about to say with the scriptures. And um, older Christians, those that are truly born again, you'll understand where I'm going with this study. Um, false Christians, newly saved people will be really confused as to what I'm about to say. Um, what is it that causes professing Christians to lose their faith, to denounce. You hear the people, they say, well, I was raised Christian and I left. What is it? Um, they find out the truth about Christianity. Um, Christianity is not life enhancement. Uh, Christianity is a life of suffering, a life of very bad things that will happen to you after you get saved, where genuinely you are born again. Um, it's a very miserable life, to be very blunt about it. Um, Again, I, I could have come in here, put on a suit and tie and whatever else. I was. This, these are my clothes. I go out and I cut, you know, chainsaw or use chainsaw and cut firewood and whatever else, dirty clothes and and things. Um, I'm not I'm not going to have some multi-million dollar studio and speak to you with a smile on my face and everything else, uh, because it's not real. And when you understand truly what the Bible teaches, and like I said, I'm going to back everything up I'm saying right now with the scriptures. When you understand it, you understand nobody in the New Testament put on their Sunday best. There's not one record of anybody tra changing how they're dressed to go fellowship with other Christians. Um, when the churches would meet together, there isn't anything about a dress code or whatever else. And that's just the reality of it. But what has happened is people come along and they take Christianity, biblical, the, what the Bible says, and they tweak it and twist it and make it into this positive life enhancement type of a thing. And they get rid of the suffering. And they say, oh, it's, it's this great thing. You just don't dare miss it. Um, that's not Christianity. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to downplay eternity and true salvation and everything else. But if you've been saved for a long time, you know the suffering that you've gone through. You know the family members that you've lost, the jobs that you've lost, the, the sickness, unexplained sickness, and the loneliness. I mean, most Christians that I know, they're ones that are really strong, they really understand their Bibles. They're very, lo very lonely people. They don't have many friends. The New Testament, Paul, the Apostle Paul, writes about, only Luke is with me. One other place in Scripture, he names six men and says, these only are my fellow laborers. Six men. What happened to the thousands of people that are being saved? Well, they're off doing their own suffering. And I'm going to get into that. Um, <clears throat> many years ago, uh, this sermon actually was inspired by an old study I did a long time ago. Um, it was called Your Worst Life Now. It was kind of a play on the Joel Osteen thing, Your Best Life Now. I actually had bought a copy of that book, and then I was going through and refuting what he was saying. And it's available still here on YouTube. You can just type in Your Worst Life Now by Brian Denlinger, and it will come up. You'll see a picture of Joel Osteen and his book, and then it says, crossed out, Best Life Now and Worst Life Now. And it's the truth. Okay, so we're going to get into this thing now, and I'm going to show you what professing Christians discover that makes them lose their faith. And all of a sudden, they're no longer a Christian, or, or they'll tweak what they believe into a new positive form of Christianity. And Christianity is not positive when you get right down to it, um, unless you're talking about eternity. Mark chapter 4, let's go there. <clears throat> and you know, those of us that are saved, uh, godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. Um, I'll never repent of getting saved. I'll never say, I wish I wouldn't have gotten saved. Uh, but my life has gone downhill quite a bit. I've lost a lot of friends and I've lost a lot of things and whatever. Um, those things that are lost to me, I count but gain for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, like Paul wrote about. 
Um, all the stuff from my past, it's, it's but dung, like the Bible says. But we'll go through the scriptures here. Mark chapter 4, <clears throat> beginning in verse 10. And again, you need to follow along in the King James Bible. Don't go with the modern ones. You know, they're, they make you too popular. You know, you're supposed to suffer for the Word of God. We'll see that here as we read this passage. Um, you don't suffer for the new versions. You don't get much persecution for that. But this old King James Bible, uh, yeah, you'll get persecuted for using this one. People make fun of it. Um, <clears throat> even though it's the greatest book that's ever been printed in world history. Matter of fact, I mean, you don't see any book that's still popular after 400 years, uh, you know, 400 years of publication. But the King James Bible is still popular among us that are saved. Uh, Mark chapter 4, verse 10. And when he was alone, they that were about him with the twelve asked of him the parable. And he said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables. That seeing they might may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted and their sins should be forgiven them. Think about what Jesus just said there. I'm speaking to par in parables to the multitude so that they don't get saved. Isn't that what he just said? He doesn't, you know, that their sins be, and their sins should be forgiven them? I'm going to speak in parables so that they don't understand because I don't want to forgive, forgive their sins. And it's not, I shouldn't say I don't want to forgive their sins, but I'm not going to forgive their sins. God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I understand that. But the, fa the fact of the matter is the vast majority of people who come and say that they're Christians and are religious and whatever, they're not real. It's a very narrow way that gets to heaven, that leads to life. Uh, very few people can take it, quite frankly. And that's why they make Christianity just this wonderful thing. And, and it's this great, oh, my life has just gotten so much better now that I have Jesus in my life. Well... That's true in some ways, but you have to make sure that the way your life is improved lines up with the scriptures. And you can't just say, well, there is no suffering for me. You know, there's no sorrow or anything else. I remember, you know, I mean, I was raised in churches going to, you know, I've been around Christians all my life. And I remember there was a guy and he said, I just can't understand Christians that are depressed. I just don't any, know anything about it. And I thought, you know, I've thought about that over the years. And I think, well, then you, didn't, you don't understand Jesus Christ. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. How can you say you don't understand people that are sorrowful and acquainted with grief when your Savior was a sorrowful man and acquainted with grief? Doesn't make any sense. Let's continue here. Verse 13. And he said unto them, Know ye not this parable? And how then will ye know all parables? The sower soweth the word. And these are they by the wayside when the, where the word is sown, but when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. A lot of people like that. Satan is uh, very interested in getting you away from God's book. That's why he came out with the lie that there's a Sinaiticus. Uh, we found this world's oldest Bible back in the 19th century, and we should change our Bibles now to read like that, even though it was a 19th century forgery. It was not an ancient Bible. It's been proven. Doing some more on that in the future. <clears throat> Verse 16. And these are they likewise which are so sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness, life enhancement, and have no root in themselves, and so endure but for a time afterward when affliction or persecution ariseth for the word's sake. Right there. Immediately they are offended. Yeah. Persecution and suffering, affliction, it comes to you. You know, back when I was a lost man as a teenager in high school, uh, I was a popular guy. I sat at the popular guy table, you know, at the cafeteria at lunchtime. Uh, all the, the sports jocks and the, the cool guys and everything else, there were two tables. Um, there wasn't, you know, we couldn't all sit at one table, but there was one table here and one table there, and I sat at this one. All the cool guys. Um, I was a dirt bike, ATV guy, and extreme motorsports type of a guy and things, and I, I was cool. You know, I had a Corvette after high school. I had a K2 
Kawasaki Ninja ZX-11 built and everything else real fast, fastest bike around, like beat anybody with that thing. I was cool. People liked me. I liked, liked to watch a lot of the Hollywood movies, and I was fun to be around and everything. And uh, years later, uh, that Brian died, and a new Brian came around that uh, people didn't like as much anymore. And now I have relatives that don't even contact me. Huh. Friends that don't want anything to do with me. They think I went crazy. A lot of suffering down through the years. A lot of loneliness. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying out there? You understand what I'm saying? All my brothers and sisters in Christ out there, the only fellowship we have is here online. We've tried the churches in the area. We've tried to go and meet with people and whatever else, and you think, oh, I finally found a Christian, and then you hear... They said that's wrong, and they said that wrong, and, they, and you try to try to you know try to kind of correct them and whatever, and they get mad at you, and and all of a sudden they're cussing you out and whatever, and you think, oh. <laughs> I thought for a minute there that they were a Christian. Well, back to the drawing board. I'll go to try to find some other place. Yeah, and then you're treated like you're scum or something because you don't have a church family that you belong to. John chapter 15. You should just compromise. Lower your standards. Well, church is a place for imperfect people. And whatever. Yeah, I get that. But there's also supposed to be doctrinal stands according to the scriptures. And if that church building doesn't follow those doctrinal stands, you can't have anything to do with it. <clears throat> John chapter 15, verse 18 through 21. Let's read that. I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. He that hath my commandments, and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. Okay? Um, oh wait, I'm sorry, that's chapter 14. Messed up there. But that one's good too because, you know, there's supposed to be separation there. John chapter 15. Sorry about that. 18, verse 18 through 21. If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. Hmm. You go to a store sometime and they are handing out the little free samples, which I guess they don't even do that anymore. But when I was young, they'd hand out, they'd have a big plate of cookies, or little pieces of cookies, and or even whole cookies, and trying to get you to buy a bag of the cookies or you know, some kind of little meat thing or whatever, or cheese or whatever else. They used to do that. You come in, there's a guy he's standing there and he has this stuff there and you say, oh, what's this? And he says, oh, well, if I give you a piece of this, you're going to suffer. Things are going to be really bad. Everybody else in the whole store is going to hate your guts. You want a piece? Uh, no, thank you. Well, I'm here to tell you today. You want to truly get saved? You want Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Okay. Jesus himself said right there in the Word of God, John chapter 15, verses 18 through 21, right there it is, here, over to there, if you are my disciple, if you get saved, the whole world's going to hate you. Are you sure you want to be a Christian? Are you sure you want to stay living as a Christian? Or are you looking for your way out right now? I've seen that for years. Get to, you know, online fellowship with people, writing emails, speaking through Skype or whatever else. I see it in the comments. And um, people are watching the, the ministry here and they're, they're saying, oh, you know, praise Lord, brother. That was a really good sermon. I'm really convicted and, and whatever else. <clears throat> I mean, see, again, most churches out there, they don't preach on sin. So a ministry like this, I preach on sin. I'm going to hit you at some point in time. And what happens is that I've seen over the years, 
I'll be preaching on whatever and everybody, you know, yeah, amen, amen. I'm not guilty of those sins, so I can amen those. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit puts it into my mind to preach on a certain subject that you're guilty of. And, all, and then you get that poke, sort of the Spirit gets you. And then I've seen people and they say, well, I was with Brian until he preached against this or against that. And then they just drop me. Only it's not me, really me that they're dropping. It's the Holy Spirit because I'm, lying, I'm saying what the, the scriptures say. So, you know, if I say something that you disagree with and my, what I'm saying is not backed up by the scriptures, well, okay, that's fine. Reject that. But what if what I'm saying is clearly laid out in the scriptures and you're rejecting it and saying, you know what? I'm tired of this legalism and whatever else. I don't, I don't really care what the Bible says. And I've had Christians tell me that right to my face. I don't care what the Bible says because I'll show them from the scriptures that what they're doing is sin. And they'll say, I don't care what the Bible says. And all of a sudden they have their little justification to go back to the world. You know, I, I was following that weird King James. I was in that King James only cult for a while and I was doing all these other things and, and, uh, Found out that that stuff was all, yeah, it's, there's problems with it. And I found my little loopholes and whatever else, and so now I cling to those, and, and I can reject that other stuff. And now I'm back, and I'm enjoying myself again out there in the world, and I have my old friends back, and I have my old TV shows I liked, and my movies, and, you know, I go out drinking once in a while, you know what I mean? And, you know, they went back to the world. They quit. So are they saved? I have no idea. I know what the Bible says about salvation, but I also know what the Bible says about a changed life that's supposed to be there. And I know what Jesus Christ said about that the world's going to hate you. You're going to be persecuted and suffer because of your stands for the word of God. Why as a Christian would you want to get away from that persecution and suffering? It's kind of weird. You say, well, Brother Brian, I understand that yeah, the lost world hates us, but my family, my family loves us. Really? Matthew chapter 10. It is my desire to weed out the tares, to get the tares out of the wheat, to purify the body of Christ. And the only way to purify the body of Christ is to shake people up with the scriptures. Matthew chapter 10, verse 34. You think your family stands with you? How about this? Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. Let me just stop there for one minute. You know, I know a lot of you out there that I've written back and forth with and whatever, and I know your stories, I know your situations, and you tell me about how terrible your childhood was and your father or your mother or both were just awful to you and rotten and whatever. You better thank the Lord for that. I said, what did you say? I said, you better thank the Lord for that. You better be very thankful that you had rotten parents because it's easier to cut ties with them. There are those of us that have had good parents and uh, parents that took us to church, parents that uh, made our lives very good in terms of worldly matters. And boy, is it rough to go against somebody like that. It's rough to have someone like that and they, they accuse you of being a liar, accuse you of being in a cult, and family members that you loved dearly, nephews and nieces that sat on your lap when they were little and you read books to them. And how they treat you like you're pond scum. You say, well, that hurts, doesn't it? Yeah. You know, and I've got a lot of scars from that. A lot of mental scars. So do you out there. I've had families write me, grandparents. Can't even see their grandchildren anymore. Their own children say, Grandpa and Grandma are in a cult. And I don't want my children around them. When they think of the memories that they have with those grandchildren, now they can't even see them anymore. So uh, if you had a bad family growing up, be thankful for that as a Christian. Because it's a lot easier just to say, I don't need them in my life. But for those of us that had a really good childhood, 
a lot of very happy memories, and then to have those relatives turn against you. That's tough. That hurts. But uh, that's what Jesus said would happen. It's not my words. It's not my opinions. It's what the Lord said. Atheists out there, do you want a part of this? Do you want your life to be worse? Well, it's all about eternity, brother. Yeah. That's where you have to think about this stuff. You see, when the Bible says it's a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief, what that really means is when you have done everything and tried everything and whatever out there and you say, there isn't anything left for me. There isn't anything in this world that I want. It'd be better if I was dead. Now you're ready for salvation. But you see, if there's still some things that allure you out there in the world and you kind of think, Okay, I'll do the Christian thing, but oh, I sure miss that stuff over there. Oh, all right, yeah, I'll, I'll try to focus on the Bible. But all the sounds of the lost world are kind of drawing me back. That's not good. You have to get to the point where you just say, it doesn't matter what happens to me. I believe the Bible is true. I know I'm going to have to suffer for taking that stand. I know people are going to make fun of me good chance I'm probably going to get killed, maybe even a slow death. Okay, but I believe in absolute truth, and I believe that this book right here is the source of absolute truth, so I don't care what it costs me. Uh, is my life going to get worse? Yeah, it's getting a lot worse, but I can't stop myself. I want to know more about Jesus, the real Jesus not the long-haired, pretty boy, hippie guy that's uh, paintings in the church buildings and whatever else. And Jesus is my homeboy and all that other satanic filth. No, no. I want to know more about God manifest in the flesh. A man walking around on this earth. Homeless Jewish carpenter. It's what the Bible teaches about him. Stripped naked. Beaten to a bloody pulp, nailed to a cross, dying in agony and pain, buried and he rose again the third day. He's got some big plans for the future. I want to know about that. And your whole family says, come on, let's go out to the restaurant. Let's go out to eat. Let's go, let's go to a movie. Let's go to the adventure park. Let's go, come on. Go, get away from me. More about Jesus would I know. More of his love to others show. More of his saving fullness see. More of his love who died for me. Like the old hymn says. I mean, read the old hymns. Read the old hymns and you'll see that thing of the suffering. One of the greatest hymn writers ever, Fanny Crosby. Blind. She's blind. Writing hymns, glorifying the Lord. Talking about struggling with sin and, and the other thing. It's not positive life enhancement. It's people that suffered. What about the martyrs suffered at the hands of the Roman Catholic Church through the Inquisition years, being tortured to death? Are you part of that crowd? I was a false professing Christian for many years, and I, the, hey, the Bible's supposed to be cool, and I want to go to the churches that are cool and have the pretty girls going there and, you know, the worship music and all the other stuff. I want to, you know, this one here is really neat. There's a lot of people go here. It must be a good place if there's lots of people going. You know, then I came face to face with the reality of who I am and the reality of what this book is really about. And I started to think, well, this is going to cost me everything. I'm an artist. Getting into better galleries, going to better art shows. A friend of the world is the enemy of God. Uh-oh. I don't think I'm going to succeed as an artist if I'm going to be the enemy, and if the world's going to hate me. Hmm. Really something. Verse 37. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. 
And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. Have you lost your life? Is there a difference? I know a lot of professing Christians, there's no difference. There isn't anything that happened that's just totally new life going in a new direction. No. My life, you know, before I started going to church, my life after I started going to church, and it's just, I'm still the same old guy. Oh, well, I'm sorry about that, but you're not saved. And I can say that with full assurance, and I don't have to worry about being wrong or anything else. I know you're not saved. If there's no change, you're not saved. Mark chapter 8. You know, and again, yeah, but Brother Brian, what about the joy? Yeah, there's joy. Yeah, there's peace that passeth understanding. But it's because people see joy and peace in you while you're suffering. You understand? The world can hate you. The world can do all kinds of bad. You know, I see people on YouTube. I had a video demonetized, and I can't believe that YouTube would do. That. Are you kidding me? Do you realize how many videos YouTube has deleted for me over the years? You know, I mean, I've been shadow banned pretty much the entire time I've been on YouTube. The only reason I'm still here on YouTube is because of God's saints out there praying for me to stay here so I can get videos out to you. This is the best video platform for me to do it, and you know. I've been over that before. Uh, Rumble has its issues and things. I have a Rumble channel, but there's issues over there. You can't download the videos and give them to the elderly and whatever else that don't have access to the internet. I'm here on YouTube because God's people have me here. But YouTube has been suppressing this channel for years. It's just the way that it is. And I can't, you know, complain about it. And, oh, that's not fair. And what it, It's what the Bible teaches. Mark chapter 8, Mark chapter 8, verse 34. And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words, right there, in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. I've seen people that are read, read now the King James Bible, but they'll change the these and the thous and whatever else because they're ashamed of the book. Uh, God said, okay, 1611, boom, there it is. As the English language is changing and things and they have to do some more refinement, whatever, with the printing presses. They refined a little bit. 1769 comes along. The Lord says, there, done, over. But it says, thee and thou and beholdeth, or something. I'm ashamed to say that in front of my friends. Ugh. Get over it. I'm not ashamed of this book. I'll preach this book to anybody. Change the words, coward. But again, are you willing to lose your life? Let's go to Philippians chapter 3. Well, not at my church. We're all friendly at my church. We, we invite lost people in and they love it. We have movie night. Community movie night. Lost. On your way to hell. Guaranteed. <laughs> Philippians chapter 3, verse 7. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Have you counted anything lost for Christ? Or do you still hold on to all your friends and family? No, nothing ever changed. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things that but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. What a way to talk about your all your happy memories of your past and everything else. Just a bunch of dung. And be found in him not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Take up your cross. Are you going to do it? If you don't, you're not a real Christian. 
It's just that simple. I mean, there's no nice way for me to put this. If I was nice to you, I'd actually be hating your soul. See? If I'm going to good words and fair speeches, I'd be deceiving you. Messing you up. Hey, let's let's just be real honest here. That's what this whole study is about. Christianity is a huge money-making business. Gigantic. And I mean the term Christianity out there, not biblical Christianity. Biblical Christianity is a, is a religion of suffering and death and uh, horrible things happening to you and whatever else, and you can have joy and peace in the midst of it. Hope, the, the hope of salvation that's coming. But life enhancement? <laughs> Are you kidding me? It's not life enhancement. You're going to have so much pain and so much sorrow and everything as a Christian. That's just the truth of it. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not after your money. A lot of people, oh, Dillinger's in this for the money. Are you kidding me? You mean, you realize how many times I have gone to preach a study. I'm recording this right now. There's my camera. There's my voice recorder. Over here's my computer in my office here. And I think to myself, boy, if I put this out, I'm going to offend this person, that person, and that person that follow this ministry, and I'm going to lose their money, the donations that come in. Yeah. And I still preach it, and I still bring it out. Why? Because I love the truth that much. That's the reason. The fellowship of his sufferings. Are you ready to have a Judas Iscariot, one of your close intimate friends, betray you? For Jesus, it was betrayed to the death. Are you going to have friends, other disciples like Peter, who misrepresents you? Denies you when you're in trouble? Yeah, Peter came back and praise the Lord for that. But the whole point is, um, you're going to go through those sufferings. Jesus walking around and he's seeing these people and he's seeing the, he can read their thoughts. I mean, I cannot fathom that. Why the Lord just didn't say, okay, everybody's dead. You know, if he's reading the thoughts of people, I wouldn't want the Lord reading my thoughts. I struggle with it. Again, lost people don't understand that. The struggle of the flesh and the spirit, the spirit of your mind. So many times I'll be there and just doing whatever and this rock music comes into my mind from my past. Uh, you know, while I was going to church, I was listening to the secular rock, you know, you know how that works. I, I don't listen to the lyrics, I just like it for the music. <laughs> yeah, sure, right. And I can, yet I can still remember the, the lyrics to the music, you know, 30, 40 years later. You know, for some of the stuff I used to listen to. But, you know, my mind starts to play this wicked music and I'm thinking, stop it, stop it. And sometimes I even start singing it. As I'm out in property working or whatever else, I start singing some secular song. Ah, oh, stop, stop. Sing a hymn. All the time. Suffering. All the time having to fight my thoughts and fight inclinations. Oh, I wonder what happens if I click on that. Oh, okay, no, all right. I shouldn't have clicked on that stupid video on YouTube. I didn't know they were going to use that much profanity in it. And shut it off. Stop watching it. Well, I wonder what happens towards the end. of No, shut it off. It struggles. You see, struggles. Up here, they have a thing for playing classic rock from the 1980s and 90s in the grocery stores. Drives me wild. I don't like to go through the, the store and hear that music that I used to listen to back when I was a popular teenager. I don't want to hear that stuff. But it's there. And I have to fight it with my flesh all the time. Suffering. You understand what I'm saying? Some of you out there, you're married to somebody who's lost. And they're playing the music and they're watching the TV. Hey, come on and sit down and watch this TV with me. And you're going, I, I can't. What are you going to do? Read your Bible? <laughs> yes, I'm going to. You're so weird. Whatever this cult that you got into, I wish that you could get out of that. I, you were a lot of fun to be around in the past and you're not anymore. I can't stand to even be around you. My best friend growing up. We grew up to go together. We were closer than brothers. Always sleeping over, you know, I'd go down to his house, sleep, have a sleepover, and play Atari and whatever else. He'd come up to my place and called me years ago. Last time I talked to him on the phone, he said, so what are you up to? And I said, I'm studying the Bible. And he laughed. He thought I was joking. He thought it was funny. <laughs> I'm not joking. No, it's real. It took with me. Professing Christian too, by the way. We were both professing Christians, raised in the same church, baptized and everything else in the same church. Yeah. Romans chapter 9. I'll show you another one. Book of Romans chapter 9. 
verses 1 and 2. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. Continual sorrow? You want to... This ministry is about supernatural, spiritual things. But you know what? I also believe in the rules of true, logical, logic-based science. So... If you don't believe what I'm about to tell you, I want you to go out and I want you to try this, okay? And you will see that I am exactly right because the scriptures are right. Go up to the average church building and walk in and say, I have continual sorrow in my heart. What would you suggest? Do you think depression is a problem? Is it a problem for me to have continual sorrow in my heart? Let me say it that way. They're going to say yes. Oh, you just need, you need to get more into you know church, your local church family, and maybe you go to the doctor for it. If it's too serious, you get some pills to make that sorrow go away. Actually, it makes it worse, but that's another issue. The average modern Christian thinks that continual sorrow in your heart, also called depression nowadays, is a problem. They think it's some kind of thing that you're doing wrong. You don't have a right relationship with God. I think the Apostle Paul had a right relationship with God, didn't he? And yet he, he had continual sorrow in his heart. Hmm. And like I said earlier, Isaiah chapter 53, a prophecy of Jesus Christ that he fulfilled. A lot of the prophecy there in, in Isaiah 53, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. I mean, you're walking down around on this earth as, a, as God manifest in the flesh and you can read everybody's thoughts. Do you think the Lord was in a good mood? I mean, where does it ever say that Jesus smiled or laughed? Maybe he did, I don't know, but probably not a whole lot. So, oh, this is just such a downer of a sermon. Doom and gloom. And, yeah, it's what the Bible teaches. Are you part of this or not? Well, I like to go to a church where it's really positive. I come away feeling really good about myself. Same childhood friend that I had literally told me that. Visited some church and he said, they made me feel bad about myself. And he said, I don't, I don't go to church to feel bad about myself. I want to come away feeling good about myself. Then that's not New Testament Christianity. New Testament Christianity is continual sorrow in my heart. Why do you think Paul said, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain? Again, try that one out. You want to try a little scientific experiment? Go to some church and say, I think it'd be a great thing if I died soon. <laughs> oh, you'll probably be you know, in the back of an ambulance headed to some padded room in a straitjacket before long, if you say that. All right? <laughs> These modern churches, what's the point, Brother Brian? The modern churches are all about life enhancement. That's what they're about. They deny what the Bible teaches. They literally, uh, we can't use this King James Bible. It's too old. It's archaic. It's whatever else. Even though scholarship, true scholarship, proves that this is the greatest book that ever showed up on the earth. Over 99% of extant Greek manuscripts support the text of the New Testament. Over 99%. And the less than 1% that are out there are forgeries. Roman Catholic forgeries. They lied. Oh, we found better manuscripts. No, you didn't. You didn't. Oh, we found older manuscripts. No, you did not. No, they didn't. And so they come out and they say, oh, we have to have all these new translations and everything else. You know, you have to have a... Oh, Veggie Tales Bible. Look how positive and everything that is. Isn't that so neat? You know, and how about, uh, let me get rid of the, some of this garbage. How about uh, magnify? That's positive looking, isn't it? You know, revolve Bible. Oh, wow. Yeah, impact your world. Impact it. Yeah, uh-huh. I mean, I have the new versions, you see. I have lots of new versions. I have them all over the place down here in my, in my study. Here where I do my work, I have them. What's it all about? It's all about people being ashamed of God's book. Literally, uh, Christians are supposed to go out door to door and whatever else. And uh, hey, don't take along a big black Bible like this thing. You know, this is offensive to lost people. A big black Bible, you know, with gold gilding on the edge. This one's been so worn for me preaching out of it for years. It's most of the gold gilding is gone. But this is offensive. This will, this will cause you to suffer. You see? 
You won't be able to build a big church building. Your corporation will be small and puny, and it won't be, be you know, 40 days of purpose and, and uh, church secrets of church growth and whatever else. You'll just be preaching to a bunch of small, just a few people or something like that, and, well, then you're kind of pathetic and whatever else. I mean, you need to use the Jack Hiles method to get in lots of people and, and um, <clears throat> preach in a dynamic way and make sure that you have the right... Uh, suit and tie on and everything else and that way you can grow and make lots of money you know it's a side benefit it's not new testament christianity it isn't it just isn't second corinthians chapter six second corinthians chapter six <clears throat> beginning in verse one we then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. People can receive the grace of God in vain. They can believe in vain as well. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 talks about that. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I secured thee, I've helped thee. Secured means that you're being helped. Think of somebody that's wounded and they need somebody to come and heal up their wounds. <clears throat> Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed. But in all things, approving ourselves as the ministers of God. You have to approve yourself as the minister of God? Yes, you do. Oh, no, I just got out of Bible college. I'm fresh, fresh out of Bible college. I have a degree. Nobody in the New Testament had a degree. Where would you get that from? You want to improve yourself, uh, approve yourself as a minister of God? Let's look at the list. In much patience. How does patience come about? Four years of seminary or something? No. It's a lifelong thing. In afflictions, in necessities, in distresses. Sounds kind of negative, doesn't it? In stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings, by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness, on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report. How many people out there on the internet, if you have some kind of a ministry here or whatever, you do videos, how many people out there hate you? How many videos are dedicated to trying to destroy you and destroy your ministry? How many websites hate your guts? Type in my name and you'll see what I'm talking about. As deceivers and yet true. People say that about me all the time, always trying to deceive people. No, I'm actually telling you the truth. If I make a mistake with some of my research or whatever else, it's not me trying to deceive people, it's my own ignorance. Understand that. As unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and not killed, as sorrowful, there it is again, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. See, there's the positive with it, but the positive always rides on the back of the negative. As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. Okay, As deceivers, I'm being lied about. People are saying that I'm deceiving others on purpose, and yet true. By good report. Some of you, I've changed your life. Praise the Lord for that. As, uh, what did I say there? Uh, by good report, an evil report. You see what I'm saying? As suffering, you're suffering. You're filled with sorrow. And yet you have peace and you have joy with it. I have a pretty pathetic life by worldly standards. I really do. This office here, uh, old run-down house in the middle of nowhere. Electricity's not that great. Um, plumbing's terrible. <laughs> Pretty much doesn't work. Running water, I don't have it hooked up to the town water because of the toxic fluoride that they put it and chlorine and everything else. I mean, very poisonous stuff. Um, you know, I, I don't have a whole lot of money. I'm not ultra wealthy or anything, even though I've been compared to Kenneth Copeland. I don't know how that works. 20 some million dollar private jet that Kenneth Copeland has in some huge ranch somewhere and I'm just like him. Yeah, okay. Um oh and but your lust for money is the same. You just don't have the same level of money. Uh well, no that's not true either because uh he doesn't preach the kind of stuff that I'm preaching to you right now because he's after your money. 
By good words and fair speech, they deceive the hearts of the simple. Not by being honest, like I'm doing right now. I will tell you, I have known literally thousands of Christians down through the years. It is a hard thing to go through. You will suffer. I mean, Jesus Christ said, I'm, the world's going to hate you. They hated me before they hated you. You want to come after me? Take up your cross. You're going to suffer. Do you understand? Well, I, I would like to, I'm suffering enough. I, I'm, I want an end to suffering. I, I want to go and have something positive and some kind of a nice religion. Then Christianity is not for you. Commercial Christianity, sure, that's, you know, that stuff's out there. You know, there's a lot better channels than this one. A lot better channels that will give you the graphics and the nice music and they'll, they'll, it's a happy, uplifting type of a thing. Um, I'm not going to do that. Because to me, it's far worse if I tell people that they're saved when they're lost than it is for me to tell saved people that they're lost when in reality they're not. You see, I'm greatly afraid of convincing people that they're doing the right thing and all the time they're, they're going to hell. I'd rather have you get mad and walk off and whatever else. Ephesians chapter 6. See how we're doing here. Ephesians chapter 6. So far we have, uh, <clears throat> in my little notes here I wrote out, Mark chapter 4 verses 10 through 17, persecuted by the world. John 15 verse 18 through 21, hated by the world. Matthew chapter 10 verse 34 through 39, Family turns against you. Mark chapter 8, verse 34 through 38, lose your life. Philippians 3, verses 7 through 10, fellowship of Christ's sufferings. Romans 9, 1 through 2, continual sorrow. And 2 Corinthians 6, 1 through 10, evil reports about you, among other things too. But let's see about Ephesians chapter 6. What do we get here? Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 12. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Did it say we wrestle um, if we want to, if we feel called? No, it doesn't say that. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, against, but against principalities, but against principalities. See, it's not flesh and blood. The people down here that, you know, their body, soul, spirit, their, you know, their soul is, is uh, lost. Their spirit is, is not, it's dead. It's not alive like our spirit is. They don't understand spiritual things. Um, that's why there's no point in rewriting the Bible to make it easier for lost people to understand and make it appealing to them because they can't understand spiritual things anyhow. But um, we're not struggling with these lost people down here. We're fighting, we're wrestling with principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places. How would you like that? Hey, uh, soldier, um, I'm going to send you out onto the battlefield out there. Uh, and the battlefield is filled with mines. There's minefield everywhere. There are snipers in ghillie suits hidden all over the ridges up there where you have to walk down through the valley, the minefield valley. Um, there's going to be air attacks going over. There's going to be artillery being launched in there. But don't worry. Everything will work out you know, good in the end. Uh, I don't think I want this. Well, how about spiritual wickedness? Uh, all the different things that we just read about there. Principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. Uh, how about enemies that you can't even see? Enemies that are so frightening that if they do manifest themselves... Um, it's a, it's a level of fear like you can't believe. I've had it happen a few times. It's horrible. It's horrifying. I mean, I'm a pretty pretty brave guy and whatever else. I'm, I don't scare very easily. But uh, I will tell you right now, um, one of the physical experiences I had with a devil manifesting itself, and I didn't see anything, I did, but I could tell it was there. Uh, there was a lot of weird stuff happening. You can watch my you know physical encounters with the spiritual realm video. I'm not going to get into all the details here, but I was, I've never been so scared in my whole life. Never. I could barely breathe. I was so frightened. Um, another time I was laying there and I felt something touch me, touch my leg. And I opened up 
and there wasn't anything there, and I heard it speaking. Horror like you can't believe. And all it took was the name of Jesus, by the way, not Yeshua um, or Yahushua or some other kind of special magic thing that you have to. You speak English, but you have to say it in Hebrew. No, just say it in English. It's fine. King James Bible says Jesus. There's the most powerful book on the earth. Say Jesus if you speak English. But I said Jesus. Jesus help me. Problem solved. Boom. That spiritual presence left. But uh, it's kind of a hard thing to think about. I'm going to have sorrow. I'm going to have family turn against me. The world's going to hate me. They're going to persecute me. And there's a bunch of illegal, or not illegal, um, invisible, invisible beings on this earth and in heavenly places. And by the way, just I've said this in many studies, but I need to say this if you're newly uh, just watching this ministry. Satan doesn't rule hell. Satan's not in, down in hell. He's never been there. Okay, Satan is in heaven with the Lord. He has to report before God before he goes out and does anything. Read the book of Job, chapter 1. You'll see it there. <clears throat> Spiritual wickedness in high places. A being that's thousands of years old, and he's got it in for you. Do you want to sign up? You want to be a real Christian? You want to be a Bible-based Christian? When the spiritual realm wants to destroy you? And the spiritual realm can influence the physical realm? Hey, uh, police. Those Christians are very dangerous. FBI. They should probably be rounded up. We should have an inquisition. They could be a danger to themselves and others. Maybe we should have hate crime laws come out so we could start to persecute those people. Every day. Every day. Well, I'm just going to be a Christian and I'll just go hide myself someplace. Not an option. Not an option. There's no, no man's land down here. The whole world is a battlefield. Wherever you go, that spiritual realm has it in for you. And the only way that you can stay strong and keep them away is by fighting. You say every day? Every day. Hmm? And many of us throughout the night. The horrible nightmares, the horrible dreams and everything else. Yeah, just fight, fight, fight. And yet you can have joy and you can have peace in the midst of that suffering. Not all bad. Mostly bad, but not all bad. <laughs> um, Romans chapter 13. You see, as I've said many times throughout this study, the reality of it is, um, people, when they start to find out these truths, I'm a Christian, and they start to get the persecution, they think to themselves, huh, that's going to get me persecuted by the world, but uh, hey, how about a skateboard Bible? This looks a lot less offensive than this one. Maybe I can, uh, maybe I can dress more like the world. I have it. Maybe we'll come out with contemporary Christian music that sounds just like the stuff that the world listens to. So when I'm going down the road, I don't have to be singing old hymns. The Bible says, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord in your heart. Ephesians chapter 5 talks about that. Hey, you know what? Maybe I can have some music. So the people listen to me, it's going, da, 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 da. you're going you know, down the road. Yeah, I've been through all that stuff, modern Christianity. It's not of the Lord. God's called you to suffer. There's no way around it. There's no way out, but up. Watch my study on that. Romans chapter 13, verse 11 through 14. And that knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make provision, not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. Put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me give you a good way to illustrate that. 
right here. This is what you call level three body armor. It is very heavy. Big steel plates inside this thing. There's the back. Sides come around and attach. I'm not going to do it because I have my lapel mic on here. It'd probably mess that up. But uh, this thing weighs a lot. Okay. And you put this thing on you. Just do it here. It's, this is the back of it. But understand what I'm saying. Why would you want to wear this? Um, you wouldn't want to wear this. It's not very stylish. And certainly it's very heavy. And wearing this thing every day, just all the time. Uh, you wouldn't want to do that. Unless you realize that you were in great danger. Unless you realize that you're in a combat zone. Then you'd say, you know what? I want to put on the armor here. Body armor. I want this on me. All the time and I don't want to take it off. Put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. See? I want protection. I want Jesus. The real true Jesus of the Bible. Why? Because I realize that there's a bad world out here that wants to kill me. They're always trying to get some kind of law or some kind of legislation or some kind of thing that they can get at us. Uh, good rulers won't do that, by the way. It's the corrupt ones and things. But when a country begins to fall into the kind of sin that America is in, um, then God starts to um, judge that nation. And it comes through the rulers a lot of times. Go to Romans chapter 8. You have to get that armor on. Make sure it's strapped on good. Romans chapter 8. Verse 10 through 18. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. You say, wait, I think the other passage there said Christ on you. Now it says Christ in you. Yeah, it's supposed to be both. <laughs> Pretty interesting. Verse 11. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. See, so putting on Christ, putting on his righteousness, all right? So that's protecting the outside of my body. But now I'm supposed to have something happen up here in my brain. The Holy Spirit of God is the spirit of your mind, comes in and he tells you what to do. So you put on the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You're supposed to be different than the lost world out there, and you're supposed to think differently. Uh, the modern churches don't do that. Again, go to these churches. Feel free to go to all the churches you want. I stand against church buildings. I've preached against church buildings. There's no New Testament scripture saying go to church. But if you want to go, have at it. Go prove things scientifically. Denlinger's a crazy nut. Okay, then go and prove it. Go on out there and say, okay, I found the perfect church. Everything's wonderful here. Everybody follows the scriptures and everything. Good for you. Wonderful. Yeah, happy. <laughs> Um, we all just get along. We just have this great time and whatever. I mean, there's good fellowship with Christians. Don't get me wrong. Again, I'm not saying just be this miserable. Mm, you know. No, I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is, you know, I did a study, another one that's YouTube deleted it, but it was called The Saint Must Walk Alone. It's on the Rumble channel. You can watch that. Um, and that was not me that said that. It was, I think, A.W. Tozer or something like that. And I read what he wrote, and then I did a sermon off of that. But uh, it's the truth. Ultimately, you will be alone. Um, but let's continue here. Verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, Christ, look at the conditional clause. If, that's a condition, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. You will suffer. I mean, again, anything at all out there. Hey, you want this new car? Okay, here before you take the keys to the new car, let me let me get these keys out of my pocket here and and uh, here you go. Here's a 
keys to this brand new car, and if you take it, you're going to suffer. Who wants it? Who wants it? Guaranteed suffering. New car. Guaranteed to suffer. Guaranteed to have sorrow. Who wants it? Family's going to hate you. Other people are going to hate you if you drive this car. Do you want it? Uh, well, I need a car to travel. I need a car to get around. It's going to lead to suffering. I still want it. I'll take it. The suffering that you have to go through in true Christianity is not worthy to be compared with the glory that's coming out there in the future. That's why you get saved. One more place to go to, Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5, verse 11 through 13. Here you have the story of uh, Ananias and Sapphira. And they were lying to the early disciples and because the sign gift thing was there, uh, it was for the Jews early on here in the book of Acts. Um, the Jews require a sign. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 talks about that. And so they, there were signs and wonders being done by the hands of the apostles. And this was one of the signs that happened here. They lied to the Holy Ghost. Peter rebukes them and they drop down dead. All right? look, what the, uh, look what happens as a result of this. Verse 11 and great fear came upon all the church and upon as many as heard these things. Fear came upon the church? Well, that would be a bad thing, wouldn't it? No, actually, it's a good thing. And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. They're there near the temple, Solomon's porch. That's what they're there. They're Jews witnessing to other Jews early on here in the book of Acts. The Gentiles are starting to take notice and things, but the gospel's not being taken to the to the uh, Gentiles yet. That comes later on. Again, understand Acts is a tradition or transitional book. But look at verse 12, uh, 13. And of the rest durst no man join himself to them, but the people magnified them. That's the mark of true Christianity. People will magnify a real Christian. They'll say. I don't know what it is about that guy or that, that woman, but uh, they have such joy. Their life is pretty terrible. I've seen them. They go through things. People treat them terribly and whatever else, and they just take it patiently. And they have joy. They're living in that dump. And yet I see them. They're smiling. They're laughing. They're joking with each other. Having a great time. I walk past there. I can hear them singing hymns out of that dumpy place. Huh. You say, do you want to join that? Me join? No, no, no. And of the rest, durst no man join himself to them. That's the truth. Um, I'm not perfect, brethren, or viewers. I make my mistakes. But you better make sure that... Uh, when I am in line with the Scriptures, you better make sure that you submit to the Scriptures and not me. But if you're looking for a way out, like I said earlier, you'll find it. You'll eventually get your uh, uh, discharge, dishonorable discharge, so to speak, from being a professing Christian. And you can go back to the world, and the world will just open arms. Come on back. Welcome. Boy, I'm so glad you got out of that cult. Yeah, I know. I was in it for a while. Yeah, man, hey, why don't we go out and party a little bit? Let's just live it up. Man, you only live once, you know, and everything. Yeah, all right, yeah, sure, come on, here, have a drink. And yeah, boy, I haven't had any of this stuff in a while. And boy, I just, oh, I'm so glad to be out of that Christian cult. Oh, it was just terrible. And this old Bible, and you can't this, and you, this huge list of can't do's, and a very small list, and shrinking all the time list of can do's. And, you know, it's tired of that. Tired of the suffering, tired of the sorrow, tired of the being mocked and put down and you can't do this for a living, you can't drink this and you can't say that and you can't look at this and you can't listen to that. And But if you're born again and you're saved, you say, you know what? I don't care if I end up alone. I don't care. That all the world hate the Lord. If all the world turns against Jesus Christ. 
I'm not going to. I don't care what happens. You wicked people out there, spiritual wickedness in high places, the principalities and the powers and everything else, all you can do to me is kill my body. You've tried to break my spirit down through the years. It hasn't worked. I'm still here. I'm not going anywhere. And I have to live this life because I want to bring courage to those of you out there that are going through the same thing. Those of you who have lost family members, not because of death, uh, well, spiritual death maybe, but um, those of you who are suffering, uh, we have to encourage each other. Um, I enjoy my life. As weird as that might sound, um, I'm happier now. I have more joy now than at any time in my past. You see, when you're a lost person, all that you're really doing is just looking for happiness. You never find it. You want peace. You can't find it. You can deceive yourself into thinking, oh, I, this is it. Boy, I love this place. Oh, man, it's my favorite place to vacation. It's my favorite place to eat. This is my favorite movie. This is my favorite food. These are the best things out there. My best friends are all coming over. We're having a barbecue tonight, big party tonight. And yet you feel empty afterwards. You say, well, I guess then I'll join Christianity. I'll become a Christian. We'll go to this nice church, and then I'll have all that bad stuff from my past. I'll have it just be, you know, with a good flavor to it. No. No, that's not it. Um, join in the fight. Come along and say, I'm ready to give it all up. I'm ready to take up my cross. If this gets me killed, if this gets me shunned, if this gets me made fun of, mocked, whatever, I don't care. I want Jesus more than anything else. And I want the truth more than anything else. And I'm willing to suffer. That, my friend, is Christianity. True Christianity. Uh, not the fake stuff that you see out there. So that is going to be it for this study. And um, if you are... I mean, you know, I'm not telling you anything that you don't already know if you're a Christian. You understand what I'm saying here. Uh, like I said, I mean, I, I know my viewers. I know a lot of your stories. I know how alone you are. You talk to me or whatever else and you and you'll say brother i just wish we could fellowship and oh, man i wish i could wish if there was some way we could just get together and and uh boy i just i have nobody yeah heaven will come we'll be able to go up to be with the lord and you know again i get these comments posties just crack me up just so miserable you know just such miserable people you know we're not going anywhere we're not going to be caught up in the clouds we're not there isn't anything like that what a bleak future you have i look forward to that day i long for that day when the lord says okay you've had enough <laughs> you know? uh come on home come up hither and we go up and we get up there we're going to look at each other and just say oh finally and you're going to be thinking, oh, I was right in the middle of doing a fun thing. Lord, why did you have to come right in the middle of the, you know, anything we have, just drop it. See ya. Bye-bye, world. You know, it's in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, so it's not like we're going to be going up slow, but I bet if we could go up slow, we'd be saying, goodbye, see ya. Yeah, what are you going? Where are you going? You can have whatever's mine. I don't care about any of that stuff anymore. Boy, you people have a rough time coming. You know, as so we're going up slowly, not going to get that opportunity because it's, like I said, a moment in the twinkling of an eye. But um, if you get it, you get it. And if you don't, you don't. It's just that simple. Um, again, I'll, I'll never be a Calvinist. I think Calvin was a foolish uh, philosopher, is all that the guy was. But um, you start to realize just how, how many people are really lost. 
you know, as you grow as a Christian. And, you know, the this constant challenge, well, how long have they been saved? Have they heard the right preaching? Maybe they didn't. Maybe that's why they're a little bit messed up doctrinally. And I wonder about this. And I want, well, I don't know. I can't really completely say it's saved or lost right now because I don't know them that well. And, you know, you didn't know all that stuff. Um, but you step back, you look at the bigger picture, and you just simply say, yeah, most people are lost. Exactly as the Bible says. Um, most people will get into Christianity and they'll either change it to suit their own desires, their own, you know, preferences, or they'll just abandon it eventually and say, oh, I was part of that cult and I'm not anymore. <laughs> That's how it works. So um, be encouraged, brethren. If you're, and, uh, if you're saved, be encouraged. Your suffering is uh, only for a moment, uh, just a little while here on this earth, and then it's glory. Wonderful, amazing time of being with your Savior. And you can go up there and you can have fellowship with him. Tell your war stories. I mean, the Lord knows them anyhow, but you know, I'm sure he'll like to hear you, your way of telling them and whatever else. and The things that you've gone through for the Lord, and the Lord will say, yeah, just like I went through. Having fellowship with my Savior. Um, some suffering that I can share with him. Not Roman Catholic suffering, you know, going around whipping yourself or something and wearing a hair shirt that's inside out or whatever so the hair's in there you know hurting your flesh and things i'm suffering not that kind of suffering okay that's fake suffering real suffering comes from having fellowship of the spirit catholics don't know anything about that um, but if you're lost now you have the truth uh, most of you probably looked at the beginning and skipped to the end to see what i'm saying in the end here um, you have the truth um, christianity is not a good thing in terms of life enhancement Terrible. Terrible way to make your life better. It's going to make your life worse. It's what the Bible says. I just showed you the scriptures. Go back and watch it and you can see all the scriptures. Um, that's just the way that it is. Yes, you'll have joy. Yes, you'll have peace. You'll have eternity in heaven. But uh, your life will get worse. So there you go. That is going to be it. Thank you very much for watching. Please do continue to pray for this ministry. And hopefully we'll see you in upcoming videos. Hit the like button, you know, and all the other stuff there because then YouTube can say, hey, at least there's a few weirdos that like this guy and, and keep me around a little bit longer or whatever. <laughs> uh, not monetized, so it doesn't matter, but you know what I'm saying. So uh, that'll be it. See you later. Stay in the Bible, brethren. Okay.